Good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to my presentation. Welcome to the Global Theater. Uh, my name is Alina Ebi. Uh, I'm a, a San Francisco realtor with Compass, but I'm also a uh, global realtor. I'm a global ambassador for uh, Romania, Moldova, and Georgia. But today I will concentrate on my hometown. It's my adoptive town, has been for 18 years, and I've been practicing real estate here for 13 years in residential uh, area. I would like to talk a little bit about why San Francisco is such a great city to invest in. We all know that it's expensive. We all talk about uh, uh, how uh, much the starting price point is. But uh, I would like to make a case why a city like San Francisco is worth investing in. So why invest in San Francisco real estate? First of all, it's a very stable and secure investment. Um, I would have some Bay Area effects and, and economy, uh, something about employment marketing, uh, the fact that uh, we have very high appreciation and uh, income. San Francisco, it's considered a superstar city. And uh, I thought about talking about that because I was asking one of my best investors clients who is European and who is the founder of a very large tech company in Europe, why he's buying so many properties in San Francisco. So far he bought six new development condos with me here. They're long-term investments, 10, 20 years, and uh, they start at uh, 900,000. He doesn't buy anything uh, for more than 2 million, so his price point is 900,000 to 2 million. And uh, he um, told me that, you know, yes, I know that the price is in high in San Francisco, but uh, to be honest with you, I only buy properties in cities where one of the market crashes or goes down or there is a recession, the real estate market goes down 20 or 25% maximum. I do not buy in cities where the market goes down 50%. I don't buy markets with a lot of supply and I don't buy in markets where it is overbuilt. So San Francisco qualifies for me, I find it safe and if I'm an investor for 10, 20 years, even shorter term, uh, I guarantee to get my money back. San Francisco is indeed a superstar city. What means to be a superstar city? They analyzed data from 1950 to 2000. The small numbers of city where housing prices rose steeply as a result of high earners who tend to cluster together over time in one area. So San Francisco is one of those cities and because of all these high earners became richer over time. San Francisco is very small, first of all. It's only seven for seven miles and it's surrounded by water in three sides and we have extremely strict environmental and development laws so that what makes it hard to build here and the supply is limited some facts the area economy if it will be an economy on its own a country on its own it will rank number 19 in the world and that's compared as i mentioned with national economies not necessarily with the local economies the unemployment rate is only 2.9%. It's amazing, right? Especially comparing with Europe and even with other parts of the United States, although in the United States the unemployment rate is pretty low. GDP in the Bay Area is the highest per capita in the United States at $100,000 and ranks ahead global peers such as London and Singapore. GDP growth was over 29% in the first part uh, of the last decade. The 7 million population, which is the population of the Bay Area, is at the cutting edge of global technology and it's a leader in many key components, uh, indicators, regional, national and global, and it's very competitive. Um, however, the San Francisco per se has only 880,000 inhabitants. You can see here just a few examples of uh, companies who are literally in my backyard. I can just uh, walk out of my door and I can see these companies, really, they are next to my home. Twitter, Dropbox, Cloud, Adobe, Zynga, Airbnb, uh, not to mention a lot of uh, biotechnology companies. It is the world capital of technology. There are thousands of technology companies uh, headquartered in San Francisco and Silicon Valley. We have over 450 biotechnology companies and pharmaceutical. It's a healthcare destination with numerous state-of-the-art hospitals and medical research institutions uh, like UCSF, for example. And of course, uh, in South Bay, we have Stanford. 
And of course, it's one of the world's main uh, touristic destination. You already know that. There are a lot of things to see here. It's mild weather. We have beautiful bridges, natural beauty. It's an exciting cultural and gastronomic scene. We have three of the best universities in the world with top ranked graduate programs, uh, UC Berkeley, Stanford and, and uh, UCSF. What's San Francisco average sales price? This is a slide that shows the price trend from 2009 to 2019. It's a little bit above 1.6 million. Uh, what can you buy for 1.6 million? Well, you can buy a single family home, but most likely you'll buy a two bedroom condominium, maybe three, it depends on the area. And uh, don't expect to be very big or to have a lot of land. If it's a house, it's not gonna have a huge land around it. It's most likely it's gonna be uh, less than 2,000 square feet. And if it's a condominium as well. So we don't have a lot of space um, to build. And uh, quite frankly, lately, the constructions were done mostly uh, vertical. Our monthly supply, it's one of the lowest in the world and in the country. It averages at three months. This is not just now in 2019 or in 2018, but this has been happening. If you look at the trends for the last 10 years, it's the same. So those are the statistics for actually average sales prices for uh, pretty much the same and the supply as well. How many days on the market actually lasts a property when we put it on the market? I'm talking about residentials here, of course, I'm not referring to commercial. Median is 15 days, literally what happens here you have a property, you put it on a market, you have two weekends of open houses. Usually we tend to underprice properties and we create a, uh, a lot of interest. We generate multiple offers. For example, we have a single family house and we, the goal is to sell it for 1.3 million or 1.5 sometimes. And we might put it on a market at 9999. And uh, that creates a lot of interest, it attracts a lot of uh, uh, buyers, and uh, we decide after two weekends of, uh, of uh, marketing the house to set a date for offers. We disclose everything, we encourage our sellers to have complete reports. We, most of the time we have complete inspection reports, best reports, or other reports. And disclosures are complete because we encourage uh, them to read them before they make an offer so the offers are as clean as possible. They are without the inspection contingencies. Of course, they are welcome to do their own inspections, but uh, this is uh, the way we work in San Francisco. And this is the median uh, number of days on the market. The average is a little bit higher, it's 25. You know that sometimes the median and average don't uh, exactly match. But uh, even that is a performance because it's very, very low. So why would you buy him, really, why? Well, high appreciation rate. It is the highest appreciation rate in California. Per neighborhood scout, it's 10%, and the appreciation trend continues because we still have very limited supply and we're not building as fast as we should. So the appreciation trend continues and makes it a good and safe investment. 2008, it was considered a market crash for most of the United States, but we were the last to enter the recession and the first to exit it. And I would like to say that our supply, our inventory of foreclosure properties was maximum 20%, if it was. Another reason would be San Francisco rental market. So if you are to invest here and to buy a rental property, this is the most expensive uh, US rental market. The average rent for a rental property is about 4750 for a two bedroom apartment. A one bedroom apartment will be about 3500 per month, if not more. It depends. If it's a building with amenities, it's going to be more. The rental vacancy in San Francisco is approximately 3.5%. This is pretty good, I think. Pretty damn good. Return on investment. Well, now some of you will say that in your markets you have a return on investment of 10% or more. We, it does not look that it's so high. This is an example. It's really neighborhood per neighborhood. Not all the neighborhoods will, will, shield, will yield the same uh, result. But this is an example in um, uh, south of Market, which is very close uh, to this. It's adjacent with this area, Moscone Center. Practically is... Uh, it's an area with a lot of uh, condominiums and apartment buildings, and uh, this is uh, an example. So you'll have a cap rate, uh, cash on cash return of 6.3%.
what investment opportunities we have here? Uh, new construction condominiums. We have this. This is pretty much what we build. We don't build single family homes anymore. Uh, we don't have room. Like many cities where the limited supply of land, we build vertically. Due to strict planning and building regulation, the new construction houses demand uh, uh, far exceed the supply. San Francisco planning to build approximately 4,000 housing units in the next five years. There is a shortage of housing that's evident. So we build only 15,853 new houses in the last five years and we added 164,000 new jobs. That's per 2017 statistics. By now, the, the number of jobs is even higher. As you know, we have a lot of IPOs, uh, companies and so on. And we didn't catch up with the construction yet. Buying a new construction condominium in San Francisco offer a good investment opportunity with real value appreciation perspective and excellent rental income, not to mention it's low maintenance. Another thing that I would like you to know about new construction is in California, we have a, uh, uh, a state law that is called SB 800 that protects the infrastructure of the building for 10 years. So within 10 years, if you see anything wrong with that property, even if it's a single family house or a big building, you could uh, go and you could literally sue the developer. Most of the issues will be uh, water intrusion. It's not really structural, but that's considered a structural um, a problem. So uh, yes, there are ways to, uh, to be protected. Single family residences, we don't build this anymore. We literally don't have room. It's very rare. Existing stuff of housing, the majority were built pre-1980 in very established neighborhoods. As I mentioned, building a new single family home in San Francisco is almost impossible. And uh, not to mention the city, the city planning rules, which is not, ne it's not necessarily bad that we have uh, um, such strict rules. Needless to say, they are very valuable. I recommend uh, single family residences, first of all, for occupancy and then, uh, of course, for uh, uh, rental opportunities. Okay, this is an example of our beautiful painted ladies, single family homes with San Francisco skyline behind. Salesforce building is missing, but uh, it's missing in a lot of pictures. It will be added soon. Other investment opportunities, multi-unit residential buildings, mixed use, luxury. What I would like to talk about luxury, this is a very um, a unique market. As right now, as today, we only have 39 single family homes in San Francisco in our MLS between 5 million and 40 million. That's all we have. Do you think it's a lot for the demand? It's not, absolutely not. There will be a lot of people who would love that, that people who are in that price point are also very picky that might not like the inventory at all. But eventually they would like it because the way they will decide on them, it's location. Location is very important in San Francisco. It's a very walkable city. If somebody does not like the house and has that kind of money, it's very easy to fix, it's very easy to remodel. So they will choose the location over anything else. And those houses, I assure you, they are in very desirable locations. You can also buy commercial buildings, of course, and land. Land is very valuable, especially if it's in Taipei. So that has been a very lucrative business in San Francisco because the average permitting for a medium-sized building, let's say 60 to 100 condominiums of apartment, you need for something like that about 300 permits. So from California and from San Francisco. There are a lot of environmental laws, as I mentioned, and it's very strict overall. What happened in the last few years, uh, local developers or people who, uh, who knew exactly the regulations, they bought land and they went through the permitting process and then they sold it to, to foreign developers already entitled, ready to shovel. That it's very lucrative as well. This is just a little bit about the market. If you have any questions, I am open to questions if you have time. And thank you for uh, coming to my presentation. What kind of people do you see is coming from different countries to San Francisco market? So the question was, uh, uh, what are the investors coming from in San Francisco these days? From what countries? So we've been very China-centric, as everybody knows. We are here in the Pacific. 
and we used to have a lot of investors from China. We still have for large projects. However, as you know, that there are a lot of tensions with China and, and also it's, it's very hard for them to get the money out of China. There are a lot of regulations there. So we tend to have a lot of uh, investors from Taiwan, Singapore, uh, from Hong Kong now. And we see more Europeans, Canadians, of course, and Latin America. It depends on what countries in Latin America. So we see more movements from Mexico uh, because I think that from other Latin American countries, they tend to go to Florida, of course. Um, and uh, yeah, we see that happening and uh, I hope we'll have more investors from China again, but we have to admit that that number dropped. How many new are in There are approximately 5,000. We are not a huge association. We are only a population of 880,000 and we are 5,000 members almost in the San Francisco Association of Realtors, but that is very really small comparing with uh, a Zola Association, for example, in Orlando or in Miami, uh, where you have a lot more. Tell us something about the Romanian community, if any, or any other Eastern European communities. Ah, here. interesting. So, yes, I am Romanian. Uh, I'm an a, a, a adoptive daughter of San Francisco, and uh, my friend and colleague here from Romania was asking me if they are, it's a large Eastern European community here, a Romanian community. There is a Romanian community in uh, South Bay, mostly working in technology. And I would say it's the same about the Eastern European one. I would say that uh, we see more mostly from Russia and Ukraine, more than from Romania. Romania is a smaller country as well, so of course they will have less people. We're all smart, right? Everybody, everybody who's coming here for those high-tech jobs, regarding from what country, is extremely well qualified. So um, I would say that we don't have as many uh, Romanians in San Francisco, and if they are, they're very well camouflaged because uh, I can't detect them. They don't look any different. <laughs> Other question? Vacation rentals policies and return on investment with vacation rentals. Uh, I think that you're referring that uh, vacation rental short term, right? You know that Airbnb is headquartered in San Francisco. You are allowed to Airbnb in San Francisco, but there are a lot of buildings with very strict regulations. Um, of course, most of the condominium buildings, they have uh, HOAs and uh, the policy is uh, long term rental, six months minimum. So despite that, of course, there are a lot of people who are not respecting the rules. They go under the radar. But if you do live uh, in your own home, you can rent. Let's say that you have a, a unit downstairs, you can rent it. You go and register your business, you declare it, you have rentals. There's been opposition. That doesn't mean that at some point the city will not appeal. The law will not come with a law restricting uh, the short-term rentals because they are uh, uh, pressures. But I would say that the return on investment is higher than for long-term um, uh, rentals. It could be 10. Uh, so it's pretty good. It works. But it has to be a certain type of property, not a new building and not in a new development. However, what I'd like to mention, um, just as an example, next to my building, for example, there is a new uh, long-term rental. They partner with Airbnb, and the developer allows the long-term tenants to rent their own apartment for up to three months when they travel through Airbnb. And you will see Airbnb displayed uh, on, the, uh, on the building, and it's a partnership. And you will see that in, in a lot of other buildings uh, in the country. I understand that it's something like that in downtown Austin. Because everybody is afraid of, of new laws restricting Airbnb, I think that this kind of developers are also pursuing the hotel license. It's very interesting what's happening, not only here, but even in Romania, where I went recently, uh, uh, they have an, uh, a, 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 a concept that's called the part hotel, where you can buy a hotel and rent it. So I think it, it happens all around the world, either it's Airbnb or another system. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for coming. and. Uh, Welcome to San Francisco, enjoy. Uh, uh,